Amen. Praise the Lord. Uh, one of the elders here at the Mountain View Central Seventh Day Adventist Church, and I do want to extend our code of welcome to those of you worshiping in person and those of you online. We're showcasing our Miramonte Christian School Sabbath today, and we're just indeed delighted. I know you guys will be blessed by the students showcasing their talents for the Lord. Amen. Amen. Our call to worship is taken from Psalms 138, verses 1 to 3. Psalms 138, verses 1 to 3. I will praise you with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing praises to you. I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. And in the day when I cried out, you answered me and made me bold with strength in my soul. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we indeed thank you for the Sabbath day. We thank you for getting us here safely to worship you in your house. And we want to thank you for bringing these young ones here today. We pray your Holy Spirit will make them bold in their spirit. Be with the student preachers as well as they bring the breath of word of life later on in the program. We ask that your Holy Spirit abide amongst us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite Miss Melbourne to, for the uh, children's story. So all the little ones come and grab a basket up here in front and make your way through the congregation. Good morning. If the kids will come on down and collect offering, and then in the, from the audience, and then you'll come back to me. As soon as you finish picking up offering, you can come on back and put it in the very big basket up front. Wouldn't it be awesome if we could fill that basket? You guys can pick that. Amen. Thank you, eighth grade. 
All right, good morning, boys and girls. How are you today? I'll try again. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you today? <laughs> Can you tell us what I do at school? Some of them know how to answer. All right, I am going to be telling you a children's story today, and I have two helpers who are going to be helping me out. Who can tell me what are these in my hand? Markers, okay. Markers, all right. And what, what are these? Cups and napkins. What do you think markers, cups, and a napkin have to do with our children's story? Any ideas? You're gonna draw on the napkins? We're gonna draw on the napkins. That's a very good point. We are going to draw on the napkins. I'm going to give Lily and Rick my helpers today, a napkin and a cup. And here's one for you. And they are going to pick a marker from me, and they are going to draw on the top third of the napkin. All right? So the very top part that's like sticking outside of the cup. And here you go. You may pick a marker to use. All right? They've picked their marker. Why do you think I am having them draw only at the top third of the paper? Any ideas? Only the top third, not the bottom, not the middle, just the top third. And Miss Melbourne is going to really quick try to do a, a design on hers as well. You can do whatever you'd like. You can do a line. You can do, thank you. <laughs> you can do a line. You can do a, a decoration or a pattern. I'm going to make a very big smiley face, maybe, if I can balance this on my hand here. All right. So actually, I decided to do three bows because I can't write in my hand very well. I gave them like a marker. So can you see what I did? No? OK, maybe I need to make it a little bit darker. All right, guys, make sure you make your lines nice and thick. All right, now, these just look like black lines, right? Does it look like anything special? No? Doesn't? Looks like waves? Thank you. It looks like waves. You're so supportive. I appreciate you, too. All right, Lily and Rick, are you ready to show us what you drew? Okay, they're still working. Ah, all right, turn it around so I can see. Okay, he's got, he's got some lines on his, too. What were you trying to draw? Can you tell me? Just lines? Okay, he was drawing lines. Lily, what are you working on? She's still working. Ah, can you explain? She drew patterns. Okay, guess what I didn't tell you? We're going to use another ingredient. What do you think I have in here? Water. And how will water affect what we have just done? Anyone have an idea? Tim? It will wet the napkin, all right? Rick? It will spread the ink all over the napkin. Any other ideas of what might happen? All right, let's put the water in and see. All right, so what if this black line represented all of us that are in church today? And we're sitting in church, and I added water to the ingredient. What do you think the water would represent if the black lines and the decorations that we've made represent us as people? No ideas? OK. So when I did this experiment at home last night, it worked much quicker than it's working right now. But that's OK. That's what happens with life sometimes. So we're going to do some life lessons. Rick was right. The water is going to spread the ink that's on the paper. And 
I'm trying to play with mine a little bit, see if we can get it to happen faster. Um, when the water reaches the ink, and you don't pour the water on the ink, because it represents the water is God in our hearts. And when God is in our hearts, we spread what? We spread love, yes. And so I think mine almost got there. I'm trying not to do it too much because I want you to see what's going to happen when God spreads love in your heart. But just in case it doesn't work fast enough for me to show you, how's yours coming? All right, swirl the water on just a little bit. Not a lot, just a little bit. All right. So when the water gets to the black ink, it's supposed to separate it. And you're going to see, your, you should see lots of colors going on, not just the black ink. Oh, is it working on lilies? Okay. You know this experiment? Okay. So normally it separates into colors with black, I'm sorry, with blue and green and sometimes pink and red. Is it starting to do it a little bit? All right, so maybe Miss Melbourne just needed, ah, it is, Lily's is working. I'll move out of the way in case the camera can see it. All right, Lily, can you come stand up here next to me so they can see? Hold yours, um, Rick, it'll, it'll happen. So can you see on, can you see on Lily's uh, cup how it's changing colors? All right, can you see the colors? Yeah, isn't that neat? So black is made up of all these different colors, just like we are made up of all different colors. With God in us, we can spread our love to everyone. And that was what I wanted you to learn for your children's story today. So thank you so much. And I'm sorry it didn't work as quickly as I planned for it to, learn, to work, but um, we'll, keep, we'll keep holding on to it. And maybe by the end of church, I'll be able to show you what it looks like, okay? Tim, do you want to come up and pray for us? Dear Jesus, thank you for the day. Thank you for the um, children's story, and thank you that we're all here today. And thank you that you blessed us our whole entire life, and thank you that you're with us through this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that children's story, Ms. Melbourne. So I have a few announcements. First announcement is in those of you who are participating in Fishers of Men School, the next class will be today at 3 p.m. Uh, just want to remind those of you who are interested in supporting the food drive that will be taking place here tomorrow. Uh, May, uh, April 14th from 4 to 5.30 p.m. As always, please see Sister Janet Abbey, uh, and you can come support the effort in the morning to prepare for the food drive in the afternoon. Just a couple of highlights from the bulletin. Uh, if you're interested in getting the bulletin, there's some stands with the QR code in the foyer. Just scan your QR code with your mobile device and get the bulletin there. Uh, Wednesday night's online uh, Bible study. We're covering the Minor Prophet of Hosea. So that series is just kicked off probably uh, a couple of weeks ago. So if you're interested, it's Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. And then April 20th, there's going to be the Step Challenge uh, Health uh, event. So. Uh, the health ministry is inviting you to take part at, uh, next Sabbath afternoon. It's going to be at Rancho San Antonio County Park, and they're going to meet in the lower parking lot. Let's see, and I think that is all the announcements I have for today. Yes. Okay, at this time, uh, it is time for our offering. 
And today's offering is for local church budget. So I'll just read the read it here. Give hope through your offering today. The impact of Hope Channel is evident in the inspiring stories of God's children like Pastor Ross and baby Aurora. Ross overcame drug addiction to become an ordained seven-day Adventist pastor after discovering Hope Sabbath School. Following baby Aurora's bronchial plexus injury at birth, she was miraculously healed thanks to our most watched Let's Pray program and the prayers on her behalf from our global community. With your offering today, Hope Channel can continue to share the transform transformational love of Jesus Christ and people all over the world by producing high quality Christian content to reach new audiences in innovative ways. Our Hope Study platform online offers Bible studies in a range of topics. So for ever, over 300,000 people started a course. Just in one year after the platform went live, people are hungering for Bible truth. As we read in Proverbs 11 verse 25, whoever brings a blessing will be enriched and one who will waters himself will be watered. By faithfully supporting Hope Channel International, you are not only blessing others, but yourself as well by bringing hope to those who need it most and by telling them of the love of Jesus Christ. After celebrating 20 years of Hope Channel and reaching over 80 countries, the Adventist message, let's make 2024 the most impactful year yet, sharing the hope in Jesus with people everywhere. May the deacons please stand for a word of prayer. Okay. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you have indeed blessed us with many, many blessings. We live in a country where there's an abundance of riches and blessings. We pray that you will move on hearts to Share those blessings with others today. Bless those who are able to give and bless those who are not able to give. We thank you that you will multiply these tithes and offerings for the saving of souls. We ask all these things in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Good morning. We are going to be singing some songs with you this morning. As soon as I figure out what I did with the clicker.
Our first song is going to be Lord, I Lift Your Name on High. There's two sets of music in there.
Good morning, church. Please join me in prayer. Father God, we come to worship you this Sabbath day. You who spoke the heavens into existence and hold the sun and moon in your mighty hands are worthy of all praise and honor. Father, we are sinners in need of your saving grace. Forgive us for our sins, Lord. Convict us when we sin unknowingly. Have mercy on us when our sinful flesh we sin willfully. Help us each day resist Satan's temptations and help us become more like you. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come together as a church family this Sabbath day. We thank you for a place to gather. While many of us are tired from a long week, we thank you for the jobs and for the incomes that they provide. We thank you for Miramonte and the education it provides to its children. We thank you for answered prayers and for the many ways you bless us each day, Lord. Father, I pray that your spirit will rest upon the speakers today. Calm many nerves and fears, Lord. Give them courage. Speak through each one of them that we may not hear their voice, Lord, but we will hear yours. I ask that each one of us will leave this service knowing that we have spent time in the most high, in the presence of the most high God. Be with us now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. My one. 
This morning, the eighth graders will be sharing a, a combined version of two speeches that have been given by some very inspired uh, speakers in American history. Um, one speech was given on August 28, 1963. I think most people are familiar with Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech that he gave for the March on Washington. The next speech is probably not as well known it was given on June 26, 2015 by President Barack Obama at the funeral of Reverend Clementa Pinckney, who was gunned down in his church along with um, the Bible study group that he was leading that day by a young man who uh, was filled with hate and um, you know, thought that maybe he could cause, um, cause a lot of chaos in the United States. And he did, not, he did not succeed with his actions. And both of these speeches have very strong scriptural themes. And so I took parts of both of them, moved them together, and would like to do a short presentation today. I have one student who's absent, so I'm going to be doing her part uh, if I remember when her part comes. <laughs> Even though we face difficulties of today and tomorrow, it's a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. We all have a dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up. This nation will live out the true meaning of this creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all people are created equal. I have a dream that one day my four little children will live in a nation Skin, but the content of their character. I have a dream that one day little black boys and black girls and little white boys and white girls will join hands as brothers and sisters. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill made low. The rough places made plain, the crooked places made straight. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. We all have that dream. This is our hope. This is our faith. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountains of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together. The Bible calls us to hope, to persevere and to have faith in things not seen. They were still living by faith when they died, scripture tells us. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting they were we are here today to remember a man of God who lived by faith. A man who believed in things not seen. A man who believed there were better days ahead off in the distance. 
a man of service who persevered. Knowing full well he would not receive those things he was promised. Because he believed his efforts would deliver a better life for those who followed. He embodied the idea that our Christian faith demands deeds and not just words. That the sweet hour of prayer actually lasts the whole week long. That to put our faith in action is more than individual salvation. It's about our collective salvation. Uh, that to clothe the naked and feed the hungry and house the homeless is not just a call for isolated charity. But the imperative of a just society. Blinded by hatred, the alleged killer could not see the grace surrounding Reverend Pickney and that Bible study group. The light of love that shone as they opened the church doors and invited a stranger into their prayer circle. The alleged killer could have never anticipated the way the families of the fallen would respond when they saw him in court in the midst of unspeakable grief with words of forgiveness. He couldn't imagine that. Blinded by hatred, he failed to comprehend what Reverend Pickney so well understood. The power of God's grace. According to the Christian tradition, grace is not earned. Grace is not merited. It's not something we deserve. Rather, grace is the free and benevolent favor of God as manifested in the salvation of sinners and the bestowal of blessings. Grace. As a nation, out of this terrible tragedy, God has visited grace upon us. He has allowed us to see where we've been blind. He has given us the chance where we've been lost to find our best selves. We may not have earned it, this grace with our rancor and complacency and short-sightedness and fear of each other, but we got it all the same. But he gave it to us anyway. He's once again given us grace. And it is up to us now to make the most of it, to receive it with gratitude, and to prove ourselves worthy of this gift. For too long, we've been blind to the way past injustices continue to shape the present. Perhaps we see that now. Perhaps this tragedy causes us to ask some tough questions about how we can permit so many of our children to languish in poverty, attend dilapidated schools, or grow up without a prospects for a job or a career. Perhaps it causes us to examine what we're doing to cause some of our children to hate. Perhaps this softens hearts towards those lost young men, tens and tens of thousands caught up in a criminal justice system, and leads us to make sure that the system is not infected with bias. Maybe we now realize the way racial and gender bias can affect us, even when we don't realize it, so that we're guarding against not just racial slurs, but we're also guarding against the sub subtle impulse to call Johnny back for a job interview, but not Jamal or Janice. So that we search our hearts when considering laws to make it harder for some of our fellow citizens to vote. By recognizing our common humanity. By treating every child as important, regardless of the color of their skin, gender, or station into which they were born. And to do what's necessary to make opportunity real for every American. By doing that, we express God's grace. And I'm convinced that by acknowledging the pain and loss of others, even as we respect the traditions and ways of life that make up this beloved country. By making the moral choice to change, we express God's grace. We don't earn grace. We're all sinners. We don't deserve it. But God gives it to us anyway. And we choose how to receive it. It is our decision how to honor it. And if we can find that grace, anything is possible. If we can tap that grace, everything can change. When we let freedom ring from every hamlet to every village. When we let grace ring from every state and city. All of God's children.
Good morning again, church. So I thought I would bring up the results of our experiment so that you could actually see it rather than just hear me say what the colors did. So of course, it's been sitting in water a really long time, and some of the initial designs are kind of gone, but you can see it's no longer just black lines, right? My name is Yolanda Melbourne, for those of you that don't know, and I teach with Rana Sato, um, 7th and 8th grade at Miramonte Christian School. In the fall, all of our 7th and 8th graders choose a topic, do the research in um, language arts class, and write a sermon. And then they're required to preach that sermon at some point in the school year. So today you'll be hearing from three people. There are a couple of changes to what's in the bulletin because we've had a lot of sickness over the last week or so running through our school. And so Emma is going to be preaching for William and she'll be speaking on, uh, let's see, I thought I had it memorized, but it's on the Ten Commandments. The Commandment with a Promise is the title of her sermon. So that is the one change in the program. We will therefore, after the eighth graders have done special music, we will start off with Gabe doing the scripture reading, followed by Sarah, who will be speaking to you on the 2300 year prophecy. These are the students' words. All I did was provide a little bit of help with grammar and you know, making sure they had quality information for you. But it is their opinions, so please don't hold it against us. Today's verse comes from Matthew 24, verses 35. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. May God add a blessing to his word. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I'm Sarah, and I'm honored to give this sermon on the prophecy of the 2300 years. So my first question is, what do you see on the screen? Okay, a ram and a goat, and what do you think it represents? Okay. Well, this image is the ram and goat of Daniel 8, and in this presentation, I'm going to explain what it means. In Daniel 8, verse 1, Daniel had a vision, and he saw himself in a province called Elam. And in the vision, he stood beside a river called the Ulai River. He suddenly saw a ram with two large horns, one being longer than the other. The King James Version said the ram pushed westward, northward, and southward. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. From my understanding, the ram stood in the east and held people captive, and these people couldn't be set free. So which empire stood in the east, according to the Bible? the Medo-Persian Empire, which was the empire that took God's people captive. There's also a specific emphasis on who ruled Babylon at this time to tell the reader that it was Belshazzar who represented the ram in Daniel's vision. In verse five of Daniel eight, Daniel once again comes across another animal. This time it was a goat. 
In the vision, the goat was seen moving so swiftly that it barely touched the ground. The goat furiously threw himself upon the ram, tackled him, and struck him with such a powerful force that both of the ram's horns broke off. This imagery meant that the goat, which was another empire, conquered the ram, the Medo Persian Empire, in a short amount of time. The two horns with the, which were struck off represent the Medes and the Persians. What do these events in the vision remind you of? Daniel 5, right? When Belshazzar, the ruler of Babylon at that time, saw the handwriting on the wall that night of feasting. That same night, Belshazzar was killed. This should go parallel with Daniel's vision where the ram was quickly trampled by the goat. The goat was the empire of Greece and the horn was Alexander the Great. What do you suppose happened to the captives of the ram after it was conquered? They were set free. After the Babylonian empire was overcome by Greece, the path was set 497 BC when Cyrus came to power to release the Israelites from their captivity so that they could rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Daniel 8 verse 8 continues by saying that the goat became very powerful. But Proverbs 16 verse 18 says, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness before a fall. How would this apply to Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire? Well, the goat, having been encouraged by his conquerings, became very proud. At the height of his power, however, the large horn of the goat was broken off. This meant that Alexander the Great's rule was stopped. After his death, four horns grew out of the goat's head. This represented the fact that the Greek Empire was divided into four kingdoms. I will not go deep into them at this time. The four horns eventually faded away and a small horn grew from out of the goat and it became exceedingly great. Daniel 8 verse 9 says, The small horn extended toward the south and the east and toward the glorious land of Israel. Its power reached to the heavens where it attacked the heavenly army, throwing some of the heavenly beings and some of the stars to the ground and trampling them. Now this is a lot to unpack. Most people believe that this small horn was one of the Seleucid kings called Antiochus Epiphanes, but his reign is not parallel with this prophecy. Moving on, what do you think it means when the horn attacked the heavenly army? According to my research done on a few commentaries, the heavenly beings would have been God's people. The stars were the leaders of the people, such as the priests, Levites, princes, and elders. So essentially, the horn destroyed the people of God. Verse 12 says, the army of heaven was restrained from responding to this rebellion, so the daily sacrifice was halted and the truth was overthrown. The horn succeeded in everything it did. This means God allowed the sin of the people to take place. People stopped praying to God and were instead led away from him. People didn't know the truth because the truth had been hidden from them. This was well accomplished by the small horn and is still being done to this day. So who was the small horn? The small horn was the kingdom of Rome. The Dark Ages in the 16th century gives an abundant amount of evidence that the Roman church fulfilled the prophecy of a small horn. Its power was so great and it persecuted the people of God and led people away from him all in the name of Christianity. The truth was thrown under the rug and people's lives were full of darkness. This topic will be discussed at a later time, but now I'm going to explain about how the 2300 year prophecy is related to all of this history. So as you can see um, on the screen over here, in 457 BC, the Israelites were released by Cyrus the Great to rebuild the temple. And in 27 AD, Jesus was baptized. Three and a half years later, Jesus was crucified. Another three and a half years later, Stephen, the first martyr, was stoned to death. 
the next 1,810 years up to 1844, Christ moved from the holy place to the most holy place, and the cleansing of the sanctuary began. This was also the year when the investigative judgment started to take place. Now, you might be asking yourself, Sarah, what does all this boring information have to do with me? My answer is, God wants us to know history and prophecy so we know what our history and purpose is on this earth. Matthew 24, verse 35 says, The kingdoms of this earth come and go, but God's word is always here. We're privileged as sinful human beings to have a God who will do anything to pardon us from our persistent rebellion. And isn't it amazing that we still have the opportunity to be saved despite how far sin has taken us? Yes. Let's use the time we have to get right with God, study his word, and do the right thing so we will not be deceived during these evil times. Thank you for listening to my sermon on one of the most confusing prophecies in the Bible. Exodus 20, verse 12 says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that, you're, that the Lord your God is giving you. Hello, my name is...
My name is Emma Kunde, and I'm going to be talking to you about the commandment with a promise. But before I do that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything you made for us. Thank you that we could be here today and that I could share your word with others. Uh, please help everybody to understand my message and send your angels to watch over us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have you ever noticed that the fifth commandment is the only one with the promise directly attached to it? Exodus 20:12 says, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Out of all the Ten Commandments, this is the only one that promises something in return. Now, while all Ten Commandments are very important, this one is a bit more important than some of the others, which is what I'll be talking about today. Both of my grandparents are 90 years old. They are not the oldest people alive, but they are living longer than most. In 2023, the current life expectancy for the U.S. is 79.11 years. They are a little over 10 years older than that. So, what factors go into living that long? Well, I'm sure the healthy diet has something to do with it, but a big factor is the fact that they honored their parents. I'm going to be honest with you, both of my grandparents are Asian. They were both born and raised in Asia. Because of this, I'm sure they honored their parents. If you're not Asian, you might not understand, but the point I'm trying to make is that Asian parents can be quite strict, and one thing they expect from their children is for them to honor them. Now, not all Asian parents are like that, but a majority are, including mine. For example, my mom expects a lot regarding respect. Yelling your ra or raising your voice is a definite no, and the same goes for the rest of my family. I once made a snarky remark since my mom said something that upset me. One of my mom's sisters was with us, and she and my mom started to complain on how disrespectful I was for my little comment. I've also been to some of my non-Asian friends' houses and just thought, wow, if I said that to my mom, she'd kill me. So, with that being said, with the way my mom and her sisters act with me, I'm sure my grandparents' parents exercised those same standards of high respect. And if that wasn't enough evidence for you, I went up to my mom and asked, Mom, Grandma and Grandpa's parents expected a lot of respect, right? And Grandma and Grandpa gave them that respect, right? She responded with a very fast head nod, which is her way of saying, yes, 100%. So yes, my grandparents honored their parents, granting them long lives because they obeyed the fifth commandment. Honoring your parents is a very important thing. There's many definitions of honor, but pretty much all of them have to do with respect. Great respect. It does not mean obey. This commandment is not telling you to obey your parents. Sometimes that gets a little lost. I've seen signs in Sabbath school with 10 commandments, and more often than not, the fifth commandment is down as obey your parents. And I'll be honest with you, up until I actually started writing this sermon, I thought it was telling you to obey your parents, but it's not. Instead, it's telling you to respect them. In practically every translation, it uses the word honor or respect, but not obey. Now, don't think this means you can go home and just not obey your parents. You can't just go home and yell, Emma Kunde told us that we don't have to obey our parents, so I don't have to listen to you guys, and then just not do your chores. If you say this, and I get an angry complaint from your parents, I'm gonna deny any knowledge of your very existence. Anyways, Ephesians 6.1 says, Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord, for this is the right thing to do. So, you still have to obey your parents. Now, you might be wondering, why isn't the commandment just telling us to obey our parents? Isn't that more important than respect? Well, the thing is, if you honor someone, you will treat them with high respect. And, you know what comes with high respect? Obedience. The fifth commandment promises that you will live long in the land as a result of honoring your parents. And God's promises always come true. Psalms 145.13 says, The Lord is faithful to all his promises and loving toward all he has made. Honoring your parents will, without a doubt, grant you a long life. And I mean, who doesn't want that? Not honoring your parents, on the other hand, is a very bad thing. By not honoring your parents, you are directly going against God's commandments. And not only that, you won't have a long life. Honoring your parents can be hard at times, but trust me, the more you do it, the easier it gets. The Israelites are a great example of not honoring your parents. The Israelites did not honor God. Not too, longer, not too long after he allowed them to leave Egypt, they created false idols and started to disobey them. Does this sound a little similar to our lives? We are the Israelites and God is our parents in this example. Our parents have done so much for us, making sure we have food to eat, clothes to wear, and are able to get a good education at a Christian school. Yet, we often do not respect them. 
We often say snarky little comments, yell at them, and say, it's not fair, you don't know what it's like to be a kid, and other disrespectful things. These are great examples of not respecting your parents. Now, if you've said or done things like this to your parents, that's okay. We are humans after all, and we're not perfect. But you know the great thing about parents? They love you. They love you no matter what. No matter what you do wrong, they'll still love you. Now, that doesn't mean you can just do bad things fully knowing they're not okay and just expect your parents to be okay with it. There will still be consequences, but your parents will still love you. I know I've done some pretty bad things that my parents have been extremely disappointed in me for doing, but guess what? They still love me. They still love me then, and they still love me now, and they deserve to get that love in return. So, how can you return that love to your parents? You can respect them. There's many ways, and some are super simple. You can be kinder to them, not yell or say rude little comments. You can do your chores without complaining, and that's something I definitely need to work on. Anyone else have to wash dishes? It's honestly not that hard, but whenever my mom asks me to do it, I spend around 10 minutes just trying to get out of doing it, which never works, and I end up wasting time. Respect is not a hard thing to do, and the more you do it, the easier it gets. To sum up what we learned in a few words, honor your parents, respect them. By respecting your parents, not only are you returning the love they deserve, but you are also obeying one of God's commandments and getting yourself a long life in the process. It's a three for one deal. Don't be like the Israelites, honor your mother and your father and your heavenly father as well. Thank you for listening.
Lamentations 3.25 says, The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search him for, for him. So make that. Hi everyone, I'm Gabriela Jimenez and I attend Miramonte Christian School. Before I start my sermon, I want all of you to participate in a small, easy social experiment. When I count to three, I'm gonna have all of you shout out a name, any name at all, the first name that pops into your head, okay? Everybody understand? Okay, three, two, one. Okay, maybe I didn't hear it, but I did notice something while all of you were yelling out names. No one shouted out the name of Jesus. Think about that. That, that doesn't count. <laughs> um, okay, but think about the person you shouted out. Think about what they do, what they represent in your life, how the high importance that your subconscious showed you. Um, so interestingly, when the social experiment is conducted with groups of people, most people shout out their spouse's name, their children's name, their parents' name, their best friend's name, or any sort of loved one. And whew, it's common for us to seek the like seek guidance and advice from people that we are close to, um, and the reassurance that we can like visibly see the person we are seeking guidance from. And though it may be hard, it is essential to remember that the individuals we do take advice from might not know the best solution for us. We have to make it a very deliberate decision to seek guidance from God and have to pray about it. And though it takes a lot, see, the thing people don't really understand about prayer is you don't get an immediate response as you do if I were to go and consult my mother about a problem I'm having. She could sit there and lecture me in the car for an hour and I would get an immediate response from her. But from God, it takes a lot longer because our, as mortals, we don't understand the, complex, the complexity of our situations. And there's so much that we can't understand and so many other variables in our situation that we can't visibly see. So today I will be preaching about waiting on God. And something I've noticed in myself and as well as others around me is that people hate waiting. P waiting sucks. There's no other way to spin that. Um, so like most people... My family and I did a two-hour commute for three years. I would have to sit in the car for two hours every evening before I got home. I hated it. I was so glad when I moved back to East Palo Alto. And whether it's waiting in traffic or waiting for your parents to help you with homework or waiting for your teacher to respond to a question when she's helping somebody else, waiting is just not one of the things we as humans enjoy. And my class and I are about to get ready to go on our eighth grade trip and we're gonna go to Catalina Island and to Disneyland and I am petrified of the amount of time you're going to waste standing in line at Disneyland <laughs> and however waiting on God is even more challenging as I said before because we can't visibly see him or touch him and I know people say that God is in the wind God is in nature God is in the building in the sanctuary that is really hard for humans to comprehend because we see these objects in these places every day, but to think that some Holy Spirit is in these things is not an easy thing to grasp. So in Lamentations 3.25 tells us, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. And before I continue, I want you to understand that this verse clearly tells us that God will grant those who wait. And to wait on God, you would therefore have to be waiting on something, an answer or um, help with something. And to communicate that with God, you need prayer because that is how we have a conversation with him. Prayer is a crucial concept in having a relationship with God. Now, I want you to ask yourself, how often do you really pray? Like, I don't mean praying as, God, thank you for the food. Like, not that kind of prayer because, like, it, it doesn't really count because, yes, we're supposed to thank God for our food, but that's not really a conversation, is it? So when you ask yourself, how often do I pray? Like, is it just in the mornings? Is it just in the evenings? So think about that, but then think about the amount of times you talk to your parents. Do you talk to your parents often? How about your best friends? I talk to my best friends every day, multiple times a day. 
and to look back on myself and my own actions and to think that I talk to my best friend more than I do God, that is extremely disappointing on my own end. So if you only thank God when things are going well for promotions, for our health improving, then we're not really seeking a relationship with God. And prayer is so essential because prayer is the one concept that connects so many things. And though we can't visibly see him, to pray you need faith. You need faith that you are praying to a higher power and that you need to also accept that you are a child of God and to cast all your worries and concerns onto him. And people who have control issues, which I do, and my parents have a hard time dealing with me sometimes, um, like it's really hard to cast everything onto something that you can't see. So if it hasn't been made clear, the sermon is more for me than it is for you. Uh, because trust me, over the past couple years of my life, me and God have like bumped heads in many circumstances. In prayer, you also need hope after putting aside control. Hope is the belief that God has like an understanding of your situation that he will prove everything to be all right in the end. Patience is also a crucial component in discussing waiting on God. I put this one last because first, it's an easier transition to everything else, but also because patience is the one thing humans struggle with the most. And if we think about it, why is patience so tricky? Who else loves crawling into bed at the end of the day? Raise your hand. Okay, majority of people. So if we can wake up every morning and go through our days, go to work, go to school, go to meetings, and then wait all those hours to crawl back into bed. Why can't we wait on God like that? Why have we as a religion and a congregation decided that we need immediate answers from God? The next time, like when you're leaving after church and you're on the highway, I want you to think about the cars around you. The different people in those cars have parents of their own, have siblings, have kids and you finally have that realization that you are not the center of the universe. And you realize that there are so many other people out there with their own lives and their own struggles. And it kind of starts hitting you that God has to deal with all of those people. And my parents can barely handle two of me and my brother. That, that's a lot. So if we can be patient with ourselves to crawl back into bed, or teachers being patient on the students. There are 10 people in seventh grade and 15 of us in eighth grade. We give them a handful every single day at school. So we appreciate you, thank you. Um, so to give you a real life example, when I was writing this sermon a, month, a number of months ago, my family and I were doing a 40 day of prayer, not really an experiment, uh, more of an experience. Um, we had a really big decision to make of whether or not we were going to sell our house in Hollister. And this was challenging because 40 days of prayer meant that we weren't going to dwell on the problem. We weren't going to make decisions of our own. We weren't going to start making plans. We were just going to wait patiently for 40 days. That was the worst 40 days of my life. Uh, me, I've like, learned for myself that I hate waiting. Waiting is the one thing I detest the most about my life. Um, but to wait 40 days and have my parents show me an example of patience and waiting on God, um, we had to be patient, but we had to like give all our worries and concerns onto him, which is another key component of having a relationship with God. So when my family did this, though it was challenging and stressful, it did end up working in the end because it gave us a chance to transition into a new chapter of our lives. It wasn't necessarily waiting for an answer, it was waiting for us to be more accepting of what was happening. And in 2 Peter 3.9, it says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not waiting, not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to come in repentance. So let me explain. You might not be waiting on God. God might be waiting on you. Um, like my family's 40 days of prayer, God didn't have to wait for us to call on him. We put our trust in him from the beginning. And 
Suppose God had to give his one and only son to this earth just for the chance that you would choose him? From the time we were born, we know nothing. And then to even start comprehending religion and God, that takes a number of years. And that is if our parents instill religion on us from birth. And to keep that going and to choose God is a really tough decision to surrender your life to something you can't see and you don't know is even there. It's just like this faith thing that nobody really can fully understand. And as we as a congregation have decided the whole immediate response thing is kind of messed up, if I don't know else how to phrase that. Um, and for us to think about it, relationships are a two-way street. That's something my parents has taught me from the beginning of my life. They can be my parents and they can love me, but to have a real relationship with my parents other than daughter and father and daughter and mother, that's a choice. And, but in our relationship, I will always be their daughter and they will always love me no matter what. Kind of like how Emma talked about her relationship with her mother. And something else I wanna share is something is happening while nothing is happening. As I was talking about before, as humans, we can only fully understand so much and the complexity of our circumstances and our situations God can sometimes use waiting to change us and change our perspectives. Just like my family, that transition period of 40 days and welcoming ourselves into a new chapter of our lives where we don't know what's happening next. And the story of Adam and Eve is a story of rebellion against God. Once they believed that God didn't have their best interests in heart, they went along and did it on their own. They put aside God and his control and their trust in him, and they did it themselves, kind of making themselves their own God. And too often, this is precisely what we do today. We don't fully, we don't let God take control of our lives and we just go ahead without him. And, but God can sometimes be using the waiting to prepare you for something else in the future. In prayer, we can ask for humility so that our waiting is not in vain. Humility is something, like sometimes I find myself getting impatient or frustrated, and I remind myself that God is the one that put me here on this earth. He didn't have to choose me to be in this period of time with this family, with these friends, with these teachers, these educators. So to realize that my life is not my own, but he created me is another thing that you have to realize when having a relationship with God. Trust then comes next, which means believing at least two things about God. He is powerful and he is loving. The miserable, uncomfortable, painful silence that God gives us is one of his most powerful tools to set us free. Believing God is powerful means that he means that we know that he's in charge of what's happening, that things are not arbitrary or out of our control or out of his control. He is capable of both helping us and changing things on our behalf. Much of our anxiety in waiting is because we forget that God can make all grace abound to us. Believing God is loving means that there is a care and purpose behind all he does. It means he is faithful in helping us and will bring, and will bring blessings later. It means that his judgment and timing are always excellent. True, he owes us nothing, but he promised us everything. Even during the long road of silence, God cares deeply for us. We can be like David and remind ourselves, wait for the Lord, be strong, let your heart take courage, and wait for the Lord. Psalms 27, 14. As I try to wrap this up, I need to remind you that patience with God will significantly benefit you. You will have to learn that in waiting, that waiting is a good thing. Maybe God needs to work out some things before you can receive the incredible gift he has in store for you. Or waiting, or he is waiting for you to come and present yourself to him. Although he knows what is going on in your heart and mind, he wants you to trust him with your problems and your wants. All you need to do is ask. God uses waiting to change us, changing us for the better and not for the worse. He instills patience in us to help us and not to harm us. Prayer and patience might be difficult because they consist of so many things, mainly humility and trust. You must learn to present everything to him and trust everything will be all right. 
He who created the entire world can and will help you throughout your struggles. Wait for God, for he is working. Sometimes you must live by faith and not by sight. Just like my family's 40 day of prayer, I hope you can apply something new in your life today. May you go in peace and have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much to our three speakers. Gabby, way to wrap it up. She was unhappy with me that I didn't mention her name at the beginning. I apologize. Listen, people, I don't like being up front. As much as you see me do it all the time, it is like a stressful thing for me. But I do it because if God gives you a talent, you have to use it, right? So Gabby, I sincerely apologize that I forgot to mention you when I mentioned the speakers. We have one more song that we would like you to sing with us, and it is Amazing Grace, the My Chains Are Gone version. And so if you will please join us, we would truly appreciate it. Wow, 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 what a beautiful program, amen. Can we put our hands together to show them the honor that we have to have them in our church, amen. Thank you so much. All the singers, the praise team, 
the preachers, amen. What an amazing three sermons, amen. I'm so happy I can retire now, amen. No more, no more preaching from here, okay. And also, thank you so much, um, Miss Melbourne, Miss Soto, and also Mr. Neely. Thank you so much, the staff, and also the parents that are here. We are so honored that you came to our church to serve us this morning, and we are so, so pleased for that. And we pray for you. And if you are here with us visiting, you're looking for a great, great school, Miramonte, one of the best schools in town. If you're looking for high school, Mountain View Academy, an amazing, an amazing school. So thank you so much again. And at this time, I will call you to stand as we close with the benediction. Before I pray, I have actually a gift for all of you. I feel good today. So you guys are only invited for lunch. Amen? So... You know where is our fellowship hall? You just go here, Springer Road, go to Castro, and the, no, no, it's just here in the back of the church, all right? So stay with us. We have a, a great dinner prepared, and let's fellowship a little bit. We'll have a good time. It's cold outside, so we'll press inside and have a good time together, all right? Let's pray. Father in heaven, what a blessing was to be here this morning, hearing from our students in their small age, but so excited about you, Lord. We hear the music, we hear the talents that you are giving them, the preaching and the effort of the teachers and leadership of the principal and Lord, we just want to say thank you for our Miramonte School. Thank you for all the blessings and thank you for the teachers and the staff that daily trust you and do their best. And Lord, thank you for the parents. Thank you for providing. It's not easy putting our kids in Christian education, but you are a great provider, Lord. And we are so grateful that together as a team between church and school, we can coach and train our children to love you and to follow you. So, Lord, we pray a special blessing upon each one. I know that you have great plans for each one. I pray that they can keep finding you and know that you are there. Lord, I also pray for the teachers and the staff that you bless each one every day, especially now as we finish the year, allow them to finish strong. And Lord, thank you for all the parents. We also thank you for our congregation. Keep us and allow us to keep sponsoring Christian education. And Lord, keep blessing us until Jesus comes. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen.